Hello, everybody. This is uh, kind of funny. Um, so my name is Ayelet and I'm a researcher and faculty at uh, UC San Diego. And with Kiki, so, so, I, so my understanding is that you've been here, uh, you know, for s those of you who are actually present have been here for a few hours. And uh, when Kiki approached me and we were trying to um, kind of decide what I should be talking about, my, my, my immediate inclination was actually to speak about my own research, which I'm extremely excited about, uh, past, present, and future. But then I thought that because I have such an opportunity to speak uh, you know, in, in one sitting, actually, with so many uh, practitioners and people that are actually trying to do good, as opposed to myself, who is trying to talk about how other people can do good, uh, that maybe this would be a good opportunity to talk about um, things that I have seen over the years as, I, I, I don't want to call them mistakes, because I think that's very patronizing, and I don't mean to, be, to sound patronizing, but I th I've, I've been consulting to some nonprofits, I've been working with others, and uh, I know from agencies and companies that consult others, the consult with nonprofits, that they, some of them share the same experience, that there are some uh, um, maybe beliefs or maybe um, just practices that uh, the field has gotten used to work with and are just not necessarily um, serving you very well. So before I'm going to delve into, and, um, and please don't get upset with me when I'm saying, oh, this is a mistake, this is a mistake. By the way, uh, perhaps with one or two exceptions, when I'm, when I'm talking about something as a mistake, you know, it's not like always a mistake. And, you know, so it's in general, right? And I don't want to think about this as me, for you to think of these as mistakes as much as I would like to think of them as um, assumptions or beliefs that maybe you should question and actually test. And I will get to that a bit later towards the end. So just to set the stage um, so that we all know what, what, what I'm talking about. So um, there is the charity um, and not the nonprofit and the nonprofit is trying to solicit um, donations as opposed to support and signing petitions and whatnot. So I'm speaking here specifically on uh, monetary donations. And you can approach warm donors and cold donors and uh, focusing on the cold donors at the bottom, this you can see my mouse. Um, Say so that you approach an individual and that the individual needs to decide whether to give. Um, they choose either yes or no, under the assumption that the person chooses yes, then they need to decide how much. So this is a very kind of general schematic, simplistic um, um, overview of let's call it the process. And what I would like to focus on is this. And more specifically, I would like, and you cannot really argue with me because you can just, you know, <laughs> yes, I, I don't agree with that. But what I would like to do is to say that how much is not really important. What I want us to focus on, what I would like to focus on is really uh, the yes, right? So getting the person to say, yes, I would like to, um, to donate. And when, when, when I'm separating the yes and the how much, I'm making an assumption, which is not not always correct, that the decision to donate is actually a two-step process. So it's a process in which the individual first says, yes, I would like to donate. And then he or she decides how much they want to donate. And I'm aware that this is not always the case in the world. So some individuals are just here's ten dollars, maybe because they decided beforehand that they have, you know, their budget for the day is ten dollars, and that's all that they're going to give. But there are ways, and I'm more than happy to speak uh, with any of you at any point offline uh, about this. There are ways to have individuals first think if they would like to donate, and only after they decide how much. Now, what is the benefit of doing that? By the way, getting to yes is not my title, so I'm stealing it from someone else. I think it's a book on negotiations. Um, so the benefit of asking, having someone say to themselves at least explicitly, yes, I would like to donate, uh, has implications on everything that follows uh, in terms of how they feel, how they behave, how they think. Um, maybe sometimes how they, how much even give at that point. Uh, and this is mostly because of cognitive dissonance, right? Because at the moment that you say, yes, this is what I want to do, or you decide to vote to a certain candidate, or you decide to vote in favor of Brexit, or whatever it is, in most cases, uh, the, the, the way we think, the way our brain thinks, or yeah, 
our mental system works, is that we're trying to um, behave and think in a way that is consistent with our, with our initial decision, right? So if I said yes, then because of cognitive dissonance, I should have a stronger support in the charity or in the nonprofit or in the cause and, and believe yeah, that, you know, this is something worthy of, of donating and supporting, donating to and supporting. And that, just as an example, can influence, you know, how much you donate, uh, your engagement in the future, retention, uh, right? So I know that, I don't know about any of you specifically, but at least all the, non all the nonprofits I've spoken to and worked with uh, had the challenge of retention uh, and word of mouth and, you know, increasing your, your you know, the get, getting to a broader audiences. So, um, Everything I'm going to talk about from now on is really about almost all of it actually, uh, focuses on this notion of getting the individual to say yes. And by the way, so I said that I'm happy to talk offline, but this is unfair because you know this is our platform now. So um, you can simply ask the question first, right? Um, would you like to help us? All right. Uh, and you can do it online and you can do it in emails and you can do it in on, on an online form. Uh, and I know that there is always, not always, but often the, the, there is this kind of uh, hesitation to do that because uh, company, by the way, also for profits, right? So companies and nonprofits are concerned that maybe someone will say, no, I don't want to. If someone says, no, I don't want to, you really don't want them. <laughs> you really don't want them to donate to you at that point, because even if they, A, it won't be much, uh, and even if they did, they would not feel very happy about it. They would not feel that they did a great thing and they would probably not remain, you know, loyal donors for the future. So it's like I'm telling my son, um, you know, he's 16 and dealing with, uh, you know, issues, you know, social as most of the kids. And I keep telling him from an earlier age, if anyone who doesn't be your friend, you know, not, it's not worth it. <laughs> and, I think, and I think you can almost think the same um, in your case. So. With that in mind, the donor or the potential donor, so we're talking about cold donors again, and the psychology or, or, or the way I believe that you should be working and communicating with warm donors is, is very different. Uh, so that person arguably is asking three questions. Why should I give to you, to, to the specific charity? How much should I give and how do I give? And I'm going not to talk about the how much, uh, by the way, I believe that the how much you have relatively little inf ability to influence as practitioners. Uh, um, each person, you know, has their own, you know, budget or rental budget or belief of how, what is the right number and whatnot. Uh, but you should give them a reason why they should why they should give, and then we always tell them how they can give. And, and, the, and the how they can give is, is technical. And I won't talk about it much. I think I have like, yeah, one or two points to make on that. But um, yeah, but it is also important because if not done correctly, and I, I did with my figures quotation marks now, which you didn't see, that can actually uh, work against you. Okay, so what do people give? So the person asking why should I give? Uh, here is here are like you see on the screen or on the slide uh, six different reasons uh, that are being, well, if you go into a class uh, or a room with practitioners, with graduate students, I think even with no, undergraduates, probably not, researchers like myself, these are the things that will generally come up. Uh, those that are naive say, well, they just have to understand the need. And I'm guessing you know better than me that it's not as simple, but it is important. So it's not, it's definitely not enough, but it's, but it's necessary. Uh, social norms, so we look how others around us, you know, behave, what they do, and we would like, usually we try to behave consistently with social norm, with, with the norms around us. Incentives is tricky, and I will get back to that a bit later, but, um, you know, incentive could be a sticker, right, bumper sticker, but incentive can also be a mug from NPR, and incentive can be something, you know, uh, posting your name publicly, right, so, you know, on, on someone's website, uh, sh showcasing, you know, showing that, that you donated. And incentives, uh, I'm not an expert on incentives, but I'm married to someone who is a big expert on incentives. I know a bit, I did a little work on it myself. And if you are using incentives, by all means, I, I really encourage you to go to reach out to someone who, who does that, who does research on that, because there is so much uh, that we know, and maybe more than that we do not know yet, 
on how incentives can actually backfire and decrease participation and decrease efforts in a very non-intuitive manners. Uh, the notion of self-signaling, I think I'm going to touch on that a bit later, um, but the general idea is, and this is a very um, strong and robust effect, and this is the idea of wanting, wanting to tell myself, right, to behave in a way that will inform me, myself, that I'm a good person, right? So the idea is that with the exception, you know, of, say, psychopaths, you know, in very extreme cases, most individuals want to feel good about themselves. So self-signaling, the idea is that uh, say that I'm going down the street and there is an old lady trying to cross the road and I decided, you know, I'm not going to continue going my way. I'm going to take a pause and help her cross the road and then go get back, you know, to my side of the sidewalk and continue walking. I will feel that I'm a good person. When you give right of way to people, even if you don't, especially if you don't need to, you feel good about yourself. So self-signaling is extremely powerful. Then there's the want just to do good. And lastly, and definitely not least, is um, wanting to feel good. And I do not know how many of you heard of the notion of warm glow of giving. I'm hoping all of you did. Uh, if you did not, Kiki has access to the relevant papers and I'm more than happy to provide, to share my own slides on this. It's not my research. I wish I was the one who came up with this notion, but I'm not. Um, I hope, yeah, and, and I can also talk to anyone who's interested about it. Of this, I would like to focus on, first of all, to, so these three, clearly, yeah, uh, the idea is that once you understand the need, you would go, right, uh, or that, that is a belief or the hope, giving everything else, you know, fits. You would go and do good, do good, in this case, is, is give money. I will get back to, to this notion of feeling good and warm glow a bit later, and I do want to say that, you know, I have like, I, I have put six circles on the screen. These things are very much interrelated. So I don't think maybe with the exception of understanding the need, which is really understanding a concept or an idea or, an idea or a problem, all the rest are really kind of mixed with one another, with one another, you know, one goes up, the other one goes up, one goes up, the other one might go down. So it's not, you know, I, I discuss them as uh, discrete ideas or concepts, but they're really not. So what happens um, with you when you say, well, uh, we have to communicate what, pro what is the problem that we're dealing with to our potential donors. And you say, we got, we're going to, to explain it to them, right? Uh, we're going to tell them what it is, how big it is, or how, how much, you know, big is also the scope, right? So, so and so many people are, you know, are being influenced. You can, it can be in terms of information of how bigger the problem is becoming over time. So kind of the trend, uh, clearly the impact on people, the environment, animals and whatnot. And I believe that I haven't seen, no, I, I've seen a few, but not many in recent years, uh, cases in which a story was not told, right? And the story can be a story of a pet, it could be a story of the person that helped and felt good because of it, it can be the story of someone who was helped and felt good uh, because of that. And uh, this is what, I'm giving you two examples of, and, and if there's anyone from any of those nonprofits, please don't take this, or the others either, as, as, as criticism, it's really just to give, to give an idea. Um, this is Siva. As SIVA, they offer um, eye surgeries for individuals developing countries. Uh, and this was a letter in which we did an experiment with them. Um, there is a woman in a story, and this is not all. There is the other part, and this is a lot of information. And I understand that you need to communicate, as we said, the problem and the scope and the impact and preferably what you're doing with the money, if you'll give me money and also ask for money. But when you see this, when I see this, when most people see this, they are like, this is too much, I don't want to read this, it's just too tiring. And uh, the other example, this is from Spark. And I don't know if you know what is the average time spent uh, on a web page. Uh, if you go, if you look at AC Nielsen and they talk generally about, uh, you know, web pages, they might talk about 10 to 20 seconds. That is not the case, uh, at least not by all sources. Um, the, the assumptions, the belief is that it's more around three to five seconds. This is not on solicitation for donations. This is on a web page. Right? 
something, when you're reading something, this is how quickly you're like, oh, interesting or not interesting. And again, this is on average, clearly, sometimes you stay on a web page for half an hour and other times you stay for a second. But people don't spend a lot of time. Uh, teenagers, those of you who have kids in high school or middle school, uh, teenagers, I believe that the statistics is 10 seconds for reading information from a web, web, web page. This is not a lot. It's definitely not enough to get through what you want to tell them. Uh, in print, you know, like they're sending a letter, it's not much, much, much better. Not necessarily. And again, maybe we're talking about call donors. Uh, too much information. So number one, uh, something to think about, food for thought. Uh, it's effort, uh, effortful to read. Uh, when I'm saying pointless, I'm not saying that the letter is pointless. But uh, what I'm trying to say, what could happen is that when the individual is reading the letter, the, the main point, right, or what, what is the most important thing for you to communicate to them except for please help, um, is getting lost because they don't read it through, because they jump, they skip, they, are they don't have the patience. And oftentimes it doesn't tap on emotions, right? Because there's a text and the text, and the text doesn't, just, does, just doesn't do that. I mean, it can do it if someone is reading it out loud, narrating it, or images as we don't know about. So I want to take a very quick kind of, um, kind of, not segue, but kind of, you know, a uh, sidetrack. So I, I used to teach marketing communications many years ago, not many, many years ago. And I borrowed this framework that was offered, um, that was given to me, not offered, by uh, someone from Stanford, the faculty at Stanford. And it kind of made me, you know, giggle at first, because it looks like ridiculous. But it's extremely uh, helpful, as I'm told, by all students who graduated uh, from this class. And so this is kind of, the, the idea is that um, speaking here is about four powers that your communication, your communication piece should have. Uh, talking about stopping power, transmission power, uh, persuasive power, and locking power. Now, the latter two I'm not going to talk about much. Uh, they are important, but what I want you to focus on is they are the first two. So stopping power, if you think about it, so you say that you're sitting and you're like browsing in, in a magazine. Um, and you see ads, commercials, right? Print ads, and, and, you, and then sometimes something just makes you stop and, and look at it. You, you want to have that, right? Same thing with the letters, same thing with the email. You know, we receive so many emails. We go through so many uh, web pages every day and links and whatnot. You want yours to stand out. Now, standing out is really difficult. It's really difficult, not because you do not have the saddest image or the most intriguing image or whatnot, but because when you do that, and again, you know that better than I do, you have to balance, you have to balance uh, the despair and the hope, right? And, and kind of it's not uh, aversive for people to look at and whatnot. But stopping power is extremely important and, and you want to have it, you want to look not necessarily, or you don't want to look too generic. Uh, and the reason I have the three seconds is because it kind of uh, gives you, gives you, and it should be three to seven seconds, it kind of give, gives you, um, an opportunity, right, uh, to communicate something. So if someone stopped on it, sorry, it should remain three seconds. If, if someone, if your stopping power was strong, was strong enough, you gained, you had three seconds to say what you wanted to say. So this is how much you have to communicate your main message. And then transmission power used to be between five and, and 10 seconds. And these days it went down because people are way more impatient. Uh, to th between three and seven, seven seconds. And this is transmission power is like said that the person stayed on it and didn't read it all the way through, but kind of only looked at it kind of cursorily, generally, you got another like four seconds at best. And again, it's all on average, uh, averages, but a bit more time to communicate your message. Now the persuasive power is, you know, if anyone bother, if is bothering to sit and actually look, that's, you know, where you have the chance to talk to them more. And looking power, please ignore it. So I wanted to just compare these two. Um, the one on the right hand side, each time I see it, it takes me a second and then I get it again. And both of these appeals are appeals uh, to do something against uh, domestic violence. And I, will, I, I have five minutes left, so I want to get, there's a lot more I wanted to get through, but the one on the right, the woman with the masculine hand, yeah, this is the one that does, that does have the stopping power, and by the way, also, it, it has everything, you all the four powers in just this one. 
which I believe is quite uh, strong. Okay, very quickly, because uh, Hiki told me I have five minutes, 30 seconds ago. Um, describing the scope, of, the scope of the problem offering statistics, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, this experiment, but individuals, if you show individuals a panda and you're asking how much you're willing to donate to save a panda, they will say $10. Uh, if you show them, you know, 10 pandas, they will say $10. This effect is called scope insensitivity or scope neglect. And uh, why is it happening? Well, we don't really know. There are all kinds of assumptions. One is uh, what you are familiar with, which is uh, that on the left hand side, uh, Ali Abbas, who was a boy that uh, um, was injured in bombing in Syria. Um, there were other, many other boys, uh, boys and men and girls that were injured in Syria. But once we had a face and a name to put to the individuals, uh, this is the amount of money that was raised to help him. Um, it could be because um, um, something that communicates um, suffering, like the one on the right, in this case it's not many kids, but imagine that there are like a hundred kids is, can actually give us a sense that whatever we're going to do is not really going to make a difference. So kind of this notion of despair. Uh, one other that I didn't mention here is uh, we're just not good with numbers. Uh, you know, for me, if you tell me, you know, million or 10 million, it's the same. So it really doesn't matter much. And the last one here at the bottom is really this notion of um, if individuals want and individuals do want to feel good about themselves, once I donated, I feel good about myself. So if I, don't, I do, donated 10 after I decided for myself that this is a good uh, amount of money to donate, that's all I need. Okay, so um, if I give $15, I wouldn't feel better about myself. If I give 20, I also want to feel better about myself. And if you made me, for some reason, give 100, I would actually feel worse. Not about myself necessarily, uh, but about the whole transaction. Giving individuals, number three, giving individuals more time to act. So uh, either keeping your campaign open, you know, indefinitely, you can always, not campaign, but you know, you say, well, you can come and donate whenever you want. Um, it, it seems like something that would make sense to do. Um, if any of you did any research on procrastination or read papers about procrastination, or if any of you is a procrastinator, uh, which I'm assuming you all are, this is not a good idea. Uh, if anything, it, uh, it diminishes the sense of urgency. And an individual that says, well, I'll come tomorrow or I will donate in a week, they will probably never donate. So, um, I'm not saying that you limit the window of opportunity, you know, the time frame to, to an hour. Uh, I am saying that you should experiment and test and see what, what makes the most sense, but you definitely don't want to keep it um, open for whenever, at least not make it um, part of your appeal. You can silently keep it open because if someone wants to give it any point, of course, of course, of course, you want them to do that. But when you are launching a campaign, you want people to act and you want them to act immediately. More ways to help, and I will uh, link it with the next one, um, which is the more ways to donate, like to give money. And by the way, this is from a, a website. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, Jesus calls. Um, um, the, the simple ways to send your donations, and uh, there are these, and this was the one on the right hand side. This one was the bottom. Uh, you have to scroll down, and you have to read it all, and that's just confusing, right? It's just but both of these things, there are just too much information. Now, they're a bit different because ways you can help, some people don't have money. Some people are unwilling to give money. So definitely you want to give them the opportunity, you know, to help or to be involved in different ways. But if you give them all of these, they're like, uh, okay, I, I will attend an event one day. And again, it links to, the, to this notion of procrastination, but you will just lose them. Okay. so. Uh, there are ways to address this. There are ways to, to, especially online in an interactive manner, to communicate to individuals and have them express and tell you how they would like to get involved. What is their choice of involvement, uh, way of involvement? And after that, you can actually, um, you know, maybe give another option or two. But definitely, um, when you hit people with so, with so many options, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the notion of choice overload, but the idea is you give, the more off, op, options you give, actually the less likely people are to choose any of them. Uh, and again, it's a tricky 
uh, trade-off because if you show offer just one, maybe it just doesn't appeal to anyone. And yeah, that's too bad. Testing, piloting, which is coming up. Um, finally, and the last one is really this notion of more causes to choose from. I know that I'm assuming that some of you uh, work for organizations that um, um, work with several non uh, nonprofits. The, this, the, this screenshot is actually from the UCSD's campaign uh, that was just last spring, and it was horrible. It was horrible in the sense that uh, people see that they're, they're, they have so so many so many um, um, topics to choose from that they a they don't know which one is more important or less important or which one they should give to. People are afraid that if they give to one, they will you know later feel bad not giving to the other. And again, in theory, this sounds like a very good idea. It actually doesn't. So even within your own programs, right? So you, if you're like one organization that has offers several programs saying, oh, look at all these 20 programs that you have. You can read about all of them and choose which one you like the most or would like to help the most. Probably not as effective as being more focused. Again, not too focused, but focused. So this is just a summary of, of, of everything I said until now and before Kiki, uh, you know, shouts at me. No, she never shouts. Yeah, but you know, uh, disconnects me. Uh, I, I do, I do, I, I will not go into this because I don't have time. I want you to take more about a uh, warm glow, but I do want to tell you uh, or, or to say that anything that interferes with this notion of warm glow given will likely diminish your efforts or undermine your efforts to, to, uh, to get people to help. So uh, what could uh, uh, you know, interfere? A charity overhead can interfere. I did my own research on that, more than happy to share it with the individuals. If you coerce, coerce someone to give, uh, if you give them incentives, or let's call them some incentives, could actually undermine, uh, crowd out people's motivation to give. So uh, if, if, there, if there was, no, actually two things I wanted you to take away from, from, from or that I want to take away from, from my presentation. One is really remember that um, you, you have to tap on this, you have to tap on people's desire to feel good about their giving and involvement. By the way, that's why people go and participate in uh, laborious, you know, activities with, with non-profits uh, as opposed to just giving money, although just giving money for many of us is just a more efficient way, you know, to go because our time is worth more. Uh, but we do go and we do get involved in kind of those, you know, uh, beach cleanups and food pantries and whatnot because we sweat and it's difficult and it makes us really feel good about ourselves. So this would be the one thing I would want you to take away. The other thing I would want you to take away is this one. It's really this notion, you know, to, to me this comes, uh, that's what I do for, you know, my research and some of you might do this anyway. This is taken from the design thinking uh, you know, presentation that I, that I often give. Uh, but the idea is really, if you look at the, at the this force, so starting with create, test, refine, and launch, you, you have uh, something that I don't have. You have access to individuals, right? You buy data sets and you, have, you work with other organizations and whatnot, and you have the ability, ability to test and see what works and what doesn't. So uh, say that you're, you know, Giving Tuesday is coming and you're about to launch your campaign and you don't know if you should tell people and uh, give them an option to donate um, 10, 20, or 50, 20, 50, or 100, or just keep, leave it open. Say so that this is the only question that you have and you don't know how to answer it. So instead of just choosing one because you think it's going to work the best, you can go and pilot. You can do, you know, you run a small pilot, A B testing, um, communicates, kind of captures what I'm trying to say the best way. You launch it, you do it, you see how people respond, you see what we're, you know, which of those actually generates, and you can decide if it's the number of donations, average donation, you know, or, you know, um, the total sum, right? And you can decide that all of them, all of those are important. And based on that, right, then you go and using that, you go and you launch. If you found, if none of those work, you know, you try again and you try again and you try again. So, um, the, 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 the piloting or the A-B testing is something that I'm, I'm just guessing many of you do not do. 
And by the way, something that worked today will not necessarily work next year because, you know, the environment changes, people's worries change, you know, the, everything is changing. So this is something that you need to do all the time. Um, and I think that's all I have time for. Thank you, Haylet. That was great. Uh, yeah, we have some time for questions. Nick? So we have a question from Jill. Do you think that having a minimum dollar amount donation might interfere with Warm Glow? Nonprofit journalism fundraising also all often has a membership minimum attached to it. Um, so your thoughts on that? Well, it, it depends on the minimum. <laughs> so um, one of the uh, things she said is that sometimes the nonprofit journalism has the, the a minimum that's up to a hundred dollars. Up to? Uh, that that the minimum can be a hundred dollars. Ah, yeah. So that is very bad. So. Um, one of the one of the nonprofits I consulted with, um, they I, th I think maybe hundred was their actually their minimum. So it was a hundred, five hundred, and one thousand. And I was like, whoa, 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 seriously? Because what that creates, right? And I don't know what is the average for you know each, each organization you know you know knows their, their donors better, but um, most individuals prefer not to give the the low the minimum, right? Because giving the minimum gives you the sense that you're cheap, that you went like. So most individuals would rather give, you know, either the middle or, you know, if they can afford uh, the top. Now, if, if the minimum is 100 and I don't want to feel bad about myself, so I will not give 100, but I will give the next amount. And let's say that that's 500. I will feel really, really annoyed, right? I mean, I will give it. And, or, so, and one option is that I will actually give the money and uh, give the donation, uh, but I will be really unhappy about it. Uh, the other option is that I will just not give anything. So I think my sense is that giving a, very, a, a high minimum amount is not the right way to go. And again, there could be that you're, you're approaching extremely rich individuals, right? Affluent that, you know, give to others and, you know, and that's the way for them to feel that, you know, it's even worth their time. Fine. So I'm talking generally in, on average, but, but I wouldn't, I, I really think that it's, uh, yeah, for, for the, you know, Average donor like myself, this is something that would really annoy me. Uh, 